Our next speaker is uh, Shai Sekunda, Martin Buber Fellow in the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Shai, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we started with uh, a joke or a comment about philosophers in the morning. Uh, I could make a similar one about philologists. Um, I'll try to keep this talk actually as non-philological as possible, given the, the crowd, but it did develop out of philological work. And I also wanted to uh, begin with thanks uh, to Yossi for inviting me uh, to this forum. Uh, and uh, again, I hope that um, what, I, what I gain from this talk is uh, a good start at beginning to think about these sort of philological issues um, legally um, and more theoretically. <clears throat> Classical rabbinic law, the late antique legal culture that birthed the halakha, Jewish law, never truly reigned supreme. Ideally, it operated autonomously at safe distance from the whirring gears of political sovereignty. Occasionally, something snagged, and the parochial clashed with the imperial. These moments of tension could, of course, be difficult for the rabbis. For modern scholars, they can illuminate questions of law and religious identity, minority legal culture, and the sovereign will to power. The foundation of rabbinic law, the Mishnah, was compiled in Roman Palestine in the year 200 CE under the direction of the Jewish patriarch. The Mishnah was the legal code of an intellectually e elite yet socially marginal group of rabbinic Jews. Soon after its publication, the Mishnah became the subject of intense intellectual focus in the two major centers of rabbinic Jewry in late antiqu antiquity, both of which were under imperial control. Again, rabbis living in provincial Palestine were subject to Roman and later Byzantine rule, while Babylonian rabbis were under Sasanian Iranian sovereignty and lived proximate to the imperial ca capital. The rabbis' discursive work led to the creation of two Talmuds, one Palestinian and the other Babylonian. For various reasons, the Babylonian Talmud soon became the Talmud, that to this day sits at the nerve center of the Jewish tradition, legal and otherwise. The Babylonian Talmud was edited during the 5th, 6th, and possibly 7th centuries in the administrative and economic hub of the Sasanian Empire, alongside Eastern Christians, Manichaeans, Mandaeans, and Zoroastrians. Each of these neighboring communities encountered, embodied, or reacted to elements of Sasanian culture and the Sasanian court. For, for Manichaeans and Christians, the encounters could be violent, and some of their surviving texts afford a particularly dark view of Sasanian sovereignty. As for the Jews, despite earlier scholarship claiming otherwise, there do not seem to have been significant or prolonged persecutions. The Talmud paints a relatively amicable picture of Sasanian Jewish, Jewish life and floridly describes the Jews as being, quote, at ease in Babylonia. It is not surprising, then, that the famously accommodating medieval Jewish modus operandi towards regnant law, the law of the kingdom is law, was initially coined in reference to a set of Sasanian rules. For the most part, Babylonian rabbis developed and practiced their legal system uncoordinated with, but also unperturbed by, the state. This was made possible by an autonomous legal space carefully carved out by the Sasanians for minority communities, including the Jews. And yet, as with all things Talmudic, the reality is more complex. There is a recurrent strain in the Talmud that depicts Sasanian rule as generally corrupt and sometimes foolish. In previous work, I've analyzed most of the Talmudic responses to Sasanian rule, both positive and negative, in an effort to highlight the complex cultural processes the deeply rooted Babylonian Jewish community underwent as it worked through its re relationship with long-standing long Iranian rule. 
Today, I would like to look closely at a Talmudic phrase and anecdote that respond to Sasanian power. Apart from the philological value of proposing what I believe is the first critical explanation of these sources, I will be highlighting the snag which made it difficult for the rabbis to fully maintain part of their minority legal system in the shadow of the imperial bureaucracy. While the dynamics are quite different from this conference's interest in religious resurgence in pur purportedly secular space, I do think that some of the issues are worthy of consideration here. The phrase that I will discuss is the Talmudic complaint, lost property to the king, avedata la malka in Aramaic which fittingly appears in an extensive rabbinic discussion of the laws of lost property. The rabbinic code of lost property begins with biblical law, which encourages finders to seek out and restore lost property to their rightful owners. There are verses in Exodus and De Deuteronomy that detail this. As with all biblical institutions, late antique rabbis receive this heritage as God's word. At the same time, they chose to simultaneously em emphasize an opposing principle of finders keepers, nicely encapsulated in the rabbinic Hebrew neologism, mitziah, found property, wherein unmarked lost objects are considered ownerless and may be legally taken by a finder. A related rabbinic innovation maintains that anyone who discovers a lost object which does have an identifying mark, a siman, a Greek loan word, is obligated to officially announce its discovery so that the original owner can claim it. It is important to point out here also that the laws of lost property were almost certainly not enforced by the rabbinic court. Rather, they were presented as the correct behavior which God-fearing Jews must observe. The Mishnah and related texts refer to a protocol for announcing the discovery of lost property. And this is source one on the handout. An earlier Palestinian passage preserved in the Babylonian Talmud, which is a fairly typical state of affairs, states that the ideal protocol was to announce dis the discovery of lost property at the one place where everyone is expected to pe appear annually on pilgrimage, namely the Jerusalem Temple. When the temple was destroyed and the pilgrimage schedule was disrupted, one was, rely, was required to publicly announce f the find for 30 days. However, when the political situation deteriorated further, described as, quote, when the oppressors increased, Mishirabu Anasim, it was sufficient merely to spread the news via word of mouth. The historicity of this source and its references to events that allegedly took place in Roman Palestine are presently less important to us than the Babylonian Talmud's reception of this text. When the Talmud asks, what are the oppressors, that they say lost property to the king, it seems to be referring to a contemporary Sasanian situation. The reference to a conflicting governmental rule in a discussion about the rabbinic code of lost property suggests that the rabbi's primary concern was not being able to properly maintain their approach in the face of an incompatible imperial apparatus. In order to understand why this is so, we will need to examine the approach of Sasanian law towards recovered lost property. A complete treatment of the laws has regrettably not survived, which is fairly typical in this field. However, we are fortunate to have a presses of a code of lost property, known as the Apitaganistan, in an early medieval Zoroastrian compilation, which likely reflects the legal norms in Sasanian late antiquity. As we find in the biblical and rabbinical, rabbinic material, the Zoroastrian code is focused first on the care of property so that it can be returned to its rightful owners, and only then with the possibility that the finder or the government may keep it. Thus, the code has a system for announcing the object, just like the rabbis. Perhaps for this reason, the code assumes the involvement of an official in the return of lost property, as we find in one passage, source number two, that requires the find finder to inform the de solar, 
the regional or town leader, when stray sheep and large cattle arrive in the, a region. That's, the, that's a quote from the first paragraph of Source 2. Other parts of the surviving code summary evince a sophisticated judicial approach, attuned to complications that might arise when sorting out dispute, disputes between litigants who each claim ownership of the lost property. That's the second paragraph of number two. The requirement to alert an official who could weigh complex, conflicting claims suggests that the Zoroastrian code was not supposed to function as a do-it-yourself guide to restoring lost property. Rather, it had a legal, we could say bureaucratic, quality to it. One of the factors that determined whether or how to award an object to a claimant was an identifying mark, Persian dakshag. This is notable from a comparative legal perspective. As just mentioned, in rabbinic law, the presence of identifying marks controls whether or not, or, or not the finder returns the object and to whom. Indeed, some of the most well-known and stimulating discussions in the Talmud engage with these marks and their import. Cons constituting an elaborate material semiotics. Another related point of interest for comparison is that in Zoroastrian law, if it is determined that the identifying marks are of a non-Iranian, ownership is immediately granted to the finder. This is source three. This is also the dominant view in rabbinic law, which despite the Bible's insistence to return, quote, your enemy's ox or donkey, maintains that this does not apply to a Gentile's lost property, or at least this is the normative review uh, approach in uh, rabbinic law. As a result, the Babylonian Talmud often wonders how the constant presence of non-Jews complicates the rules of lost property, and I gave you just three examples of this in Source 4. The repeated invocation of non-Jews as a complicating factor reveals, firstly, a social reality in which Jews were well integrated into sustaining Mesopotamian life. It may also ref reflect the tensions inherent in prom promulgating a particularistic and intricate legal system in a messy, legally pluralistic environment like Sasanian Mesopotamia. Tensions could flare up when the authorities had a specific ritual or legal reason to mix in, and an example uh, that I like is in the closing of bathhouses in the Sasanian Empire. The bathhouses were needed by Jews for purification, and also by Christians for that matter, but problematic for Zoroastrian priests who feared contamination of the sacred element, water. Now I don't think that factor is operative here, but others are. Those areas where Sasanian law discriminated against non-Zoroastrians, and concurrently where rabbinic law differentiated between Jew and Gentile, could have been especially tense. I also would venture, and I would like to explore and develop this further uh, in the future, I, would, I also would venture that problems may have been caused by a certain density, right, a sort of theoretical density of overlapping legal ritual systems. Finally, it is possible that the Sasanian imperial machinery had a tendency, like all imperial systems, to flex, flex its bureaucratic tentacles from time to time and intervene. In the case of the rabbinic rules of lost objects, all four of these factors may have played a role. Given the similarities between the Sasanian and rabbinic approaches, especially regarding identifying marks and announcement requirements, and the fact that these rules were supposed to govern lost property found within a heterogeneous public domain, it is even possible that Jews were tempted to ignore rabbinic dictates and began to consult Sasanian courts. And that Sasanian courts, in turn, expected such a public area of law to be dealt with solely under their jurisdiction. Moreover, there may have been a financial incentive for the Sasanian legal system to get involved, since under certain circumstances, the ownership of lost property might revert to an Iranian finder or even to the Iranian sovereign. As we saw previously, the rabbinic law did not officially require the return of lost objects to non-Jews, and at the same time, a Zoroastrian might legitimately take the stray animal of a non-Zoroastrian as his own. Finally, a Sasanian bureaucratic impulse could have made things quite difficult for a rabbinic Jew who simply wanted to obey his community's dictates in peace. 
In light of the largely unregulated function of the rabbinic code of lost property, it would seem that it was the imperial bureaucracy in particular that led to the Talmudic complaint of lost property to the king. As with Talmudic civil law more generally, the rabbinic lost property laws constitute a highly detailed prescriptive system that nevertheless seems to have deliberately avoided direct enforcement of the regular activities of its legal subjects. This may have been especially the case regarding a requirement like the obligation to return lost property, which is not based on a natural principle to avoid harming others, but a less obvious requirement to actively seek out someone else's good. This is different than the famous Good Samaritan Law, which protects people when they are seeking out others' good. Um, again, while rabbinic law does indeed have a protocol for announcing the discovery of lost objects, unlike the Sasanian system, there's little evidence of an enforcement mechanism that assured compliance. And this actually can be nicely con contrasted with the rabbi's scholastic neighbors at the Christian school of Nisibis, unfortunately I forgot to put this on the handout, who threatened expulsion from the school to anyone who did not inform the dean of finding lost property. Thus far, I have focused on the Talmudic phrase, lost property to the king, and have tried to understand it by locating the rabbinic laws of lost property alongside the Zoroastrian code. Interestingly, the subsequent story, and you can see this by going back to source one, about a rabbi and a Roman appears to be animated by a similar comparative impulse. In this anecdote, a third cent century Palestinian rabbi comes across a lost money bag of coins. Following the dictates of rabbinic law, the rabbi would normally pick up the money bag either in order to announce its discovery, if it had identifying marks, or to keep it for himself. Yet the presence of a Roman bystander causes the rabbi to hesitate, presumably because he's unsure of the imperial stance on lost property and whether the Romans were oppressors who did not allow the Jews to observe the laws as they saw fit. Fortunately, the Roman reassures the good rabbi that he has nothing to worry about since unlike the Persians, the Romans maintain that a finder is perfectly justified in taking lost property for himself. By the way, in the printed editions, it just says a person instead of a Roman, and the whole force of the story is lost. Interestingly, the Roman bystander's accusation can be matched with legal realities. As we saw with the Zoroastrian Code, um, finders were required to report to the regional leader, and this may have been interpreted by some officials as license to get involved in the recovery of lost property, including seizure. The laws preserved in classical Roman legal corpora, and I have some choice quotes, uh, numbers five and six, may further illuminate both the Roman bystander's response and Rav Ami's initial hesitation. The earliest recording, ru recorded ruling in the subject attributed to Hadrian Rules that if a finder discovered hidden treasure, and treasure is a slightly different concept, but it's the Roman analog, it is to be split between the finder and property owner. If the property was owned by the emperor, then the emperor would take half. If owned by the public or the city, then the fiscus would take his share. Roman law underwent a no number of developments. Hadrian's rule was reversed in 315 when Constantine declared that half the treasure must go to the Roman fiscus no matter where it was found. But a later ruling, dated to 380, again reversed the law and stated that pr the property owner receives a fourth, the finder claims the rest, while the fiscus received nothing. Just as the bystander proudly told Rav Ami that the Romans were more magnam magnanimous than the Persians were getting lost property, a subsequent ruling issued about a decade later similarly draws attention to the law's benevolence. Now it's tempting to read this story as accurately re reflecting a historical clash between three approaches to property. However, a naive historical reading of the Talmudic account is problematic and misses out on a crucial interpretive key. First, Ravami lived in the third century, while the Roman position granting the property solely to the finder did not take shape until late in the fourth century. More generally, modern Talmud scholarship has cautioned us to be skeptical, skeptical of the historicity of all Talmudic stories, which were not recorded as real-time transparent historical accounts, rather constitute intricate literary specimens that underwent protracted textual evolutions over the course of centuries and often across the Palestinian-Babylonian divide. 
In the present case, there is reason to believe that, Rav Ami, that the Rav Ami anecdote holds some kind of relationship to a highly critical tale about Alexander the Great, recorded in a parallel passage from the Palestinian Talmud, source number te- seven. I'm getting close. There, Alexander tells a wise Oriental king that in the West, the, the greedy policy towards lost property after killing the lost property claimants it's almost a satire, is that the treasure goes to the king, this time in Galilean Aramaic. This phrase, Sima alat la malka, is strikingly similar to the Babylonian Jewish Aramaic lost property to the king. In fact, given what we know about the relationship between the two Talmuds, there's reason to believe that the expression somehow served as the textual kernel in which the Talmud's phrase, the Babylonian Talmud's phrase was built. More specifically, while in the Palestinian Talmud, Alexander the Great, a symbol of greedy Western imperialism, is lampooned for violently seizing the property from its finders, in the Babylonian Talmud, it is an impressive Persian policy that disrupts the rabbinic rules of lost property, and which a Western figure, the Roman, critiques. Thus, while the Rav Ami anecdote does not provide a cleared window into 3rd century Roman Palestine, it might still complicatedly refract the views of Timonic sources as they developed over time and were transferred from east to west. It is possible that earlier Palestinian accounts, including the story about Alexander's visit to the east, and perhaps also the reference to observing the laws of lost property in oppressive times, referred to the difficulties of maintaining the rabbinic system under a domineering regime that actually seized recovered property. This would be actually typical of rabbinic views of the imperial west and its unjust loving of taxes, for example. However, when these sources migrated to Sasanian palace uh, Babylonia, the problem shifted from an outright and more dangerous class clash to a more bureaucratic one. Because the Zoroastrian code was similarly oriented towards returning the lost property via identifying marks and announcements, it presented a special kind of challenge. The Babylonian rabbis faced complications in maintaining their approach to lost property under Sasanian sovereignty. They perceived the Sasanian bureaucratic system of lost property as both, quote, oppressive and painful. The painful is in uh, a source, uh, another source about this in source number eight. Typically, Babylonian rabbis imagined that the grass was greener on the other Roman side of the fence even while earlier Palestinian rabbis depicted a Eastern king as being far more just just than the Western sovereign. When they told a story about a Palestinian rabbi who stumbled across the lost object, instead of thinking that the rabbi would simply be ignored by Roman, they imagined the latter as actively encouraging the sage to take the object for himself. This, in fact, was not necessarily the correct rabbinic plan of action, since, as I said, the lost property may have had an identifying mark in it. As it turns out, even in this daydream, the Roman was telling the rabbis how to act. When it came to the rabbinic code of lost property, the rabbis simply wanted to be left alone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ayy. Do I see? Please, Suzanne. Thinking as you were speaking about trying to also relate some of the themes you developed with what Lena Develop, I was thinking while I was that reading. There's a huge overlap uh, on the question of using the obligation to return lost property as a marker, right, of what Lena called, I think, semi citizenship. And but if, I'm, if I remember correctly, the obligation to return lost property is not included in the Noahide Code, right? It's sort of one of those markers of a difference right. between what everyone else owes and what Jews owe. And Atlas already developed this into a notion of how you can mark right memberships in different communities, so that membership in the covenantal community transforms these duties of benevolence, right, as you phrased it, into obligations. And then there's a kind of clear indication somehow of what's actually you know a sort of conventional duty that you need for a just society, minimally just society, versus what's benevolence. Yes. Uh, so I thought maybe we could make a link of sorts and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, the, it def- there definitely is this uh, feature of, um, I guess, communal identity uh, there. And 
it kind of cuts different ways. You know, I mentioned in the Bible, there's this emphasis on returning the enemy's lost property. So the rabbis are really doing something kind of radical by saying the enemy refers to kind of internal enemy. Um, uh, at the same time, you're right. I think part of what's going on here is because of the inherent super tagger, the su right, um, the lifnim uh, shuratedin, the above and beyond, uh, the call of duty nature of this aspect of law is key. In other words, the rabbis themselves recognize, and this is elaborated at the end of the chapter. Uh, the Talmudic chapter, the second chapter of Bava Metzia, um, on these laws, that these laws are by their very nature, again, they use that phrase, lifnim shuvatadid, above and beyond kind of the call of duty, and yet they're required. So for that reason, it could be the rabbis wanted to conceive of them as a special communal marker. You're helping me think through this, so thank you, as opposed to uh, a regular Gentile legal system from the rabbi's view, where, where it would be sufficient simply to avoid harming someone else's property, uh, and, that's, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Shai, and thank you, everyone, for a wonderful session.